Yeah, record. You, okay. Yeah, I started okay. recording. Yeah. Okay, Everyone good. Yeah. So, so, okay. So let us start our seminar. So this is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Yimen Chiao. Uh, he is a distinguished professor at Michigan State uh, University. I believe he is foundational professor in probability or stochastics. This is really big honor. This is person who is leading direction in one of the world leading universities. Uh, <clears throat> professor uh, Chiao, uh, obtained his uh, PhD in 1996. After that, he had a couple postdocs and also spent some time at Microsoft Research. But after that, he joined the uh, Department of uh, Statistics and Probability at Michigan University. And I believe from that time, he is always with this department. He, he is well known, definitely, person in many uh, areas of stochastic uh, analysis and probability, in particular about Gaussian random fields, stable uh, processes, fractional LP fields, sem self similar processes, measure theory for random fractals, and I can continue and continue. I, I follow him on ResearchGate, and now I see that he has more than 200 publications or publications and uh, preprints. And we are very glad that he is uh, given talk today. You mean uh, the screen is yours? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Olenko and uh, Professor Borovkov for the kind invitation. It's really great pleasure for me to first time meet you almost like in person. It's not in person, but we see each other. That's really great. And uh, for a while, we know each other for like 30 some years already. And uh, the last time we saw each other was uh, before the pandemic. That's 2018, right? So it's almost four years. We have not been able to see each other. So it's really nice to, uh, to meet again online. Uh, so today my talk is on multivariate Gaussian random fields. Uh, I'm going to mostly focusing on two aspects. One is some sample path properties like a continuity, regularity, or fractals. And the other aspect would be uh, some extreme value or excursion probability uh, uh, problems. In the audience, I know uh, the, the, there are so, uh, you know, experts on these topics of random fields and uh, crossing probabilities and so on. So uh, if you have any comments or any questions, just uh, you know, feel free to interrupt me uh, anytime. Uh, so we, uh, we can make this uh, a lively uh, discussion. So for multivariate uh, Gaussian random fields, I'm gonna start with two classes of such random fields. One of the class comes from statistics, and the other class came oh, from. Uh, from intro, but I have the other Sorry, class. Could you please mute yourself uh, if you are not a speaker? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the other class is a multivariate extension of fractional Brownian motion. And it introduces more feature uh, statistically and also uh, some of the things that can be applied to characterize the random fields in probability ways. So we're, we're gonna see what those two kinds of uh, random views are. So here's a general setting that I'll start with. Uh, it will be vector valued D dimensional. So takes values in RD. Also, it will be indexed by a vector. So T is in Rn. It could be in R1, that's fine. But uh, you know, in general, it could be in Rn. Now, for multivariate random fields, something interesting is that the components are dependent. And we are interested in their dependent structure to see how they are, you know, depend on each other. How does the dependence among the components might affect the behavior of the random field or property of the random field? So that's something that uh, we wish to characterize. Now, since they don't have to be identically distributed, right? Then they may have different statistical and probabilistic features. They could be, you know, any sort of topic. They could have different, uh, let's say, roughness, some like a Brownian motion or some like a fraction of Brownian motion of different indices, right? Some can even be differentiable. They can all be coming together to form a multivariate random field. So we want to characterize some of these aspects, but as you will see, obviously that uh, uh, I, you know, there's so much that I don't know. I have curious, curious questions. Uh, but uh, not too many tools to answer, you know, some of those questions. All right, so here's the notation for the 
coordinate process xi and xj, I use C, I, J, S, and T to denote their, let's say, cross covariance. I assume the mean to be zero. So this is the covariance function or cross covariance function. Now, the first class of multivariate uh, Gaussian random field that I'm going to focus on is a class of stationary, stationary multivariate Gaussian random fields formed by using matern covariance function to formulate this cross covariance functions. Right? So by saying that I have a matern type covariance function, it is a covariance function of this form. Now this is a power function. There's a parameter new in there. And here is a special function. This is a, a, a base of function, modified base of function. It does not have a explicit form, but some of the asymptotic behavior are quite uh, you know, well known. We're gonna take advantage of that. And uh, many people in spatial statistics, they very much like this family of uh, spatial models because as the parameters vary, this family of you know, spatial models provides very rich properties or structures. For example, if this new, this new parameter is the smoothness parameter, if this new is between let's say zero and one, you would see fractal behavior the sample function that you obtained by looking at this as a function of t, right? I call it the sample function, will be rough. However, if you let this new grow, the sample function will get smoother. So if this new is bigger than one, you would have first order continuous derivative. If new, new is bigger than two, you could have second, right? Second order. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so, uh, this new parameter is a very important parameter for us. And of course, there's also a cover, you know, variance parameter and a scale parameter I'm, uh, we're not going to get into there. So these are very active statisticians. They introduce this family of multivariate uh, you know, uh, Gaussian, not necessarily Gaussian, but we're gonna work with Gaussian. They just talk about covariant legitimate you know, covariance matrices. They give necessary and sufficient condition in the special case that I'll mention in the five-year-old case, they actually provide a necessary sufficient condition for functions of this type with entries to be matern covariance function to be legitimate. Now, before I, before I go there, I want to emphasize that uh, there's another way to characterize the matern covariance function. One way is through this, you know, uh, modified basal function, which, you know, the drawback is that it doesn't have a explicit uh, expression for this covariance function. So it's not always easy to work with. However, it's the Fourier transform of a relatively simple function. So in other words, the spectral density of a, let's say just to take one, this is the real value, right? Just take one of them with parameters fixed, then those parameters are, now, they appear in the density, a spectral density function. Now, this guy, on the other hand, is quite, quite you know, it's, it's explicit and quite simple. It tells us that uh, if this A does not equal to zero, then the random field with matern covariance function does not have long range dependence because the spectral density does not blow up at zero. However, the local properties can be characterized quite well just by looking at the power of this term in here. So this is the reason I would say, uh, I like this uh, you know, density very much because it's very revealing. It's relatively simple, right? So we're gonna come back and try to use the, the spectral density later on. All right, as I mentioned that uh, these three authors, they give characterizations for a family of matrices formed by such functions, allowing different parameters, right? In, at each entry to be legitimately covariance matrix. So that's not an easy task. They did a great job in there. More importantly, I think for the case, simple case of bivariate case, their condition actually, they give necessary and sufficient conditions. So that's beautiful, that's beautiful. But we're not, we're not go, going to go there. What I want to try to say is that given a stationary Gaussian random field with this covariance matrix, how do we characterize the properties, I mean, the probabilistic or statistical properties of the bivariate random field? So this is the question that we wish to answer. 
We can talk about, uh, let's say, regularity properties of the sample function. We can talk about the fractal properties of these trajectories of the random field. We can also talk about the excursion or extreme probabilities formulated by the components of this bivariate random field. And how those things, those questions can be answered by in, or in terms of the parameters in the covariance function. And besides each component has their own parameters, right? The cross covariance also has a correlation coefficient. The cross correlation will also come into play. So what I want to say in advance is that some of the properties will show these parameters explicitly. Some of the properties will not because some of the properties may be pretty rough. They just depend on some you know, salient parameters, important parameters, and some less important parameters got absorbed, right? got uh, you know, disappeared in some of the uh, properties. However, some other places they do show up. So we want to, to figure out where they affect the results and what kind of results that they will be affecting and how they are affecting those results. All right, so this is a first class. So necessary sufficient conditions, I'm gonna skip. The second class of multivariate Gaussian random fields is a vector or multivariate extension of fractional Brownian motion. Now, fractional Brownian motion is a very important family of Gaussian processes, right? Which has, you know, stationary increments, which are self-similar and has fractal properties and the long range dependence. Very nice for applications. But for random fields, there are, there are more possibilities to define, you know, something similar, but it's more general than the ordinary fractional Brownian motion. So we're going to start doing that. And uh, we're going to, everything is based on, the general theory developed by uh, Yagnon. Uh, he had a theory on covariance function of processes with stationary increments. So the process may not be stationary, but they are stationary in the sense of stationary increments in here. And of course, I should say that at this moment, uh, uh, you know, stationarity of increments, this is also you know, a special invariance property for the distribution of the random field. You can further relax this condition by considering not just the increment like this, you can consider increments of higher orders, right? So in those cases, you would be naturally lead to intrinsic random functions and, uh, and that theory was developed by Methro in the you know, 72, 73, extending the work of uh, Yaglom. So this is a you know, very powerful framework that, uh, that uh, people can use to construct various kinds of random field models with a certain invariance property. But however, here we just consider a slight extension from the stationarity, which is we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, random fields with stationary increments in this sense. All right, now this is an operator fraction of Brownian motion. It was, as far as I know, it was first introduced by uh, David Mason and uh, Maijima in 1994. In their paper in the uh, stochastic process applications, they introduced this so-called operator fraction of Brownian motion, operator uh, linear fractional stable motion with T lying in R. You know, real variable. And then with Mason, uh, we extend it to random field setting, but it is, I'll show you the definition. You can see that it's special case of the general class of self-similar or operator self-similar Gaussian random fields. So more general work was done by uh, Didier, he was a student of uh, Vradas Pipiras uh, in the uh, uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. They had a series of papers, you know, uh, studying their statistical and uh, probabilistic properties. And we're going to define that. We're going to define operator fraction of Brownian motion. There are two ways to define, at least two ways to define operator fraction of Brownian motion. We can start from, let's say, the definition of fraction of Brownian motion. For fractional Brownian motion, you can use the so-called moving average type representation. You can also use harmonizable representation. Both of them, they are equivalent up to constants. Now, if we replace this self-similarity index H, which is a number in fractional Brownian motion, right? By a matrix, 
by a linear operator, then it is possible to show that the integral representation still makes sense. So it would genuinely define a random field or vector valued process or vector valued random field. So that's the basic idea. It's a simple idea. Now, in order to carry out this idea, we need to, you know, guarantee to be able to verify that the integral does make sense. The integral of a multivariate function, right? There are linear operators involved, but that part is uh, is uh, uh, is not too difficult. It's basically just uh, you know extending a winner type of integral from scalar function to multivariate function, and the procedure follows the same way. What you need though is to quantify the size of your functions, and what kind of norms that you're going to use to formulate. You know, it is integrable, it is convergent or not, right? So, so for that purpose, we're going to make use of this operator norm of a linear operator. So D is a linear operator. It is a D by D uh, matrix, okay? And it defines its uh, operator norm by this one. It has eigenvalues. Uh, its eigenvalues are written in this form. And it turns out later on, we'll, we will show that the real part of the eigenvalue are more important than the imaginary part of the eigenvalues. Most of the regularity properties, fractal properties, they are all defined, decided by this real part of the eigenvalues. The imaginary part induces some kind of, you know, sometimes a, a, a rotation. Uh, but it does not change the nature, right? If you rotate some object, you know, a, a fractal is still a fractal. It does not change the size of fractal dimensions, but it does change the position or angles and things like that, right? So, so, so the, the imaginary parts sometimes play this secondary role. And the first, you know, the most important roles are played by those real parts of the eigenvalues. Now to, to Make things simple for formulation. We uh, order them, order the eigenvalues so that uh, the you know real parts going from small to large. I here already put a restriction over the size of this guy already. This is because I am going to define fractional Brownian motion in order to guarantee that my multivariate function satisfies the integrability condition later on, I will have to require this eigenvalue real parts are not big. If it's bigger than one, then the, the, the integrability condition will not be satisfied. You won't be able to define a fraction of running motion. But if you're not to define fraction of running motion, we define more general multivariate uh, random fields, you're totally fine. You could have, you know, you could use linear operators with eigenvalues whose real parts are bigger than one. That's fine, right? So, so, but for us, we don't need that because we're going to just mention fractional Brownian motion. So that's the first thing we'll need, this, uh, this uh, uh, operator norm. Now, to characterize scaling property, we remember that uh, for, uh, for, for Brownian fraction of Brownian motion, you have, let's say, uh, H, and then if you scale the time, right, you have your process. This process would have the same distribution to a constant C to the power H times B of T. So these two processes will have the same finite dimensional distributions. However, if we use a linear operator, then this self-similarity will not will not be true anymore, it will not hold anymore. It turns out that it will, it will satisfy the so-called operator self-similarity, which is to say that we're going to replace this constant c to the power h by c to the d, which is a linear operator, right? So, so basically, uh, you are getting something just like the fraction of Brownian motion, except that the, you know, you're, you're using a, a matrix to do the scaling. Right? So for that purpose, we need this exponential of a, of a matrix. All right. So as I said that we could define operator fraction of Brownian motion in several ways. If I take, oh, well, actually, uh, Mason and Meijima, they already they did that. They took the definition of fraction of Brownian motion given by, let's say, Van Ness and Mandelbrot at Van Ness. Right? This is a moving average representation. They replaced the H by matrix D, replace number one by the identity matrix. So using the previous page, this is a, this is a linear operator. Now this linear operator can, can be 
integrated against a vector valued random measure. Oh, here, this is just a vector valued Brownian motion because you're talking about uh, integrating something over the real line, right? So given this definition, it's, it's pretty self you know, evident that uh, as long as we, we, we can justify what this definition of this integral is, is defined, then many of the statistical properties or pro probabilistic properties can be derived very much in a similar way you know, as those for fractional Brownian motion. So it's not surprising that uh, you know one can verify this process has stationary increments. This process has the so-called operator self-similarity. As I indicated in the last page, if you scale the variable and the distribution will not change if you scale the space appropriately. So you have this uh, invariance property for the distribution. So it's a, it's a uh, very nice definition. And of course, it's not the most general definition of uh, operator fraction of Brownian motion because it only gives you uh, one type of uh, uh, representation. So, so DDA and the Pipiras, they you know, studied this in much more general framework. They could do much more than uh, just uh, you know, what I'm gonna talk about. The previous representation does have a limitation, which is to say, well, using this you know, representation, it's more natural to work with to work with R. If you want to work with Rn, in other words, if you wish to define a random field, then this thing over here does not really make too much sense, right? So you have to do something else to just to make things work, right? Def in the define something which is not something which is you know directly related to fraction of running fields that we're familiar with. For this reason. It is much more convenient to use the harmonizable representation. So in this representation, if this D is H, I is one, then it gives a fraction of Brownian field that we're familiar with. So the, the, you know, since we have already know the, a fraction of a fraction of a Brownian field, we want to have a operator or multivariate version of that, right? So by replacing the constant uh, H by a matrix and uh, this by I, you can show that this is indeed well-defined, right? So this does define an operator fraction of Brownian field defined on Rn with values in Rd. This guy also has the same property like a uh, stationary increments and operator self-similarity uh, as in the previous page. So these are the two kinds of objects. One is a stationary multivariate random fuse. The second is non-stationary, but has stationary increments. And we care about, uh, uh, about their properties. So with these two examples, we, you know, we, we, we think that uh, it, the family of multivariate random fields are pretty rich, right? So we want to study them. Uh, so first the aspect of things we look at are the sample path properties, like regularity. So let's say uniform modules of continuity. Right, uh, uh, fractal measures, fractal dimensions, uh, heating probabilities like potential theory for Gaussian processes or for Levy processes. Many of the questions still make sense if we raise them for multivariate random fields. However, to answer them is totally different story. Some of the questions can, can be asked, but there are no methods to answer them. So, so, so they are open questions. And there are also, local times, you know, Brownian motion has local time, Markov process, Levy process have local times. They are very important, the active functionals. But for random views, they also have those objects. So we want to study some of those things. So in the following, I will mention a couple of results over here, and I'll mention some results over, over here, just to, to give, a, give a, you know, a, a, a brief overview of what questions can be asked and how much we can answer but you, you can see immediately that the more questions are not answered than the answers that uh, you know, we, can, we are able to provide. All right, it turns out the, all these properties, right? These properties, they depend on real parts of the eigenvalues. That's just the, you know, the, the first sentence. The second sentence is, if you want something more precise, Let's, for example, you know, Brownian motion is a holder of any order smaller than a half, right? If, if this is good enough, 
then that's a beautiful result. However, if you think it's not precise enough, right? Anything smaller than one half, it's not exact. So Levis module continuity says that is square root, right, of h times log one of h. That's the exact modulus continuity. Now, if you want to have the exact modulus continuity, just having the real parts of the eigenvalues will not be sufficient. So for that reason, if you want to uh, derive more precise results, you need to work with things which are more precise than just the eigenvalues. You need to know the specific forms of your matrix. So it turns out that if this matrix D has this uh, real canonic you know, uh, form, it's either it's a diagonal or block diagonal or you know, forms of uh, or, uh, blocks of uh, matrix of this form. Each of these form introduces some specific functions into the regularity uh, characterization of multivariate random fields. So this is something that uh, uh, I, I, I wish to, uh, to, to convey. And uh, so, so with, the, with this couple of notations uh, in, in, in hand, it turns out that of course, uh, the simplest case is that the matrix uh, is, is diagonalizable. If it's diagonal block, then the function will be simpler. If it is a block like this, the order of this this uh, this thing over here, so it's, for example, is two p times two p. Then this p will come into play. We'll pick up some nice functions decided by this p. So we'll see that uh, this will happen for let's say for operator fraction of Brownian motion. So I'm going to uh, focus now on operator fraction of Brownian motion. Give an example of what a rec precise regularity property would look like. And multivariate random fields, we care about the regularity. This is, the, that can be derived based on the regularity of each component. So we just focus on xj. So for xj, the modulus continuity of this real value to process over an index cube, let's say a rectangle, right, is defined by this thing over here. So that's the modulus continuity. Now, since the process is continuous, as h goes to zero, this guy goes to zero. So we wish to know how fast it goes to zero. Uh, in an earlier paper with David Mason, we proved that if uh, I know the exponent and this guy has a real canonical form, then each specific form would give rise to an integer pj. Okay? And, uh, with this pj, the modulus of continuity is of this form. So it's not necessarily just as a square root of log. You know, th this is the scaling, of course. And this comes from, the, for in the, uh, in the brown emotion case, just square root of log one of h, right? Coming from the, 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 the Gaussian tail, right? It's the inverse of the Gaussian uh, tail probability. However, you know, if the, the matrix is not, you know, di diagonal, uh, di diagonalized uh, ma matrix, then this PGA could be bigger than one. So in other words, you would be able to get something which has a higher power than the square root of just the log of one of H for this factor. So that's the phenomena that is introduced by operator fraction of Brownian motion. Now this result was, precise in comparison with the known results for let's say Brownian motion or Gaussian process. But that's not a mathematical proof because after all, this was just an upper bound, right? So we always want you to say that, well, is this sharp? Is this a lower bound? Is there a lower bound, right? And of course, this, the answer to this question would depend on exact form of your D. Now we can say that if I know the exact form of the D, we can, we can get exactly what this PGA is and then to get the lower bound. And this is something that uh, uh, I'm gonna, uh, going to explain as exact results, right? So for the exact results, the basic idea is that we can get a harmonizable representation for xj. And I would like to get some information on the spectral measure of this harmonizable of this uh, exponent because this guy has stationary increments, right? So it, it, it has a spectral measure based on what the Yaglom's general framework would give. 
right? So we need to know what that thing is. So for this matter, we're going to do some computation. So the jth component will be just the inner product of this vector with this jth entry, jth member of this, uh, you know, uh, of this standard base. Now, because of this, we can write it down in, in this, uh, just expand it, right? You know, you have a you have a matrix which has a row multiplied with these guys in the column, and I get this thing over here. Now, this one, of course, is not a nice integral because it's a combination of integrals. So we're going to use an equivalent representation for this, so that we derive a homologizable representation of this, which helps us to identify the spectral density or spectral measure. And of course, uh, this can be done by comparing the covariance functions, right? So, so, so we say, uh, well, in order to continue, uh, we're going to specify uh, the block corresponding to xj, right? So, th at this moment, I think it's safe to ignore some of the uh, the details. And eventually, we did some of the you know computation. And we raise this guy to, to the exponential and identify the jth row. Now, with the jth row, I can multiply with the w's in here, right? So we will be able to get a representation. Here's the representation. Please just ignore the, the, the intermediate steps leading to here. So eventually, we say that xj has a stochastic integral representation. It's a homologizable representation with the spectral measure given by something like in here, maybe the square of that. And this guy is, is, is not that bad, okay? It's not like fractional Brown emotion was only a power function. Now you pick up some, some other, you know, slowly varying factors. But these guys are still very nice, you know, uh, very nice to handle, especially if we only care about the asymptotic behavior, right? So eventually it allows us to prove that the up and the lower bound of the variogram are given by the real part of the eigenvalues, as well as the order of the Jordan cell that corresponds to xj. So this is, a, this is you know, this is precise up to constants. And because of this representation, we can also prove that the process XJ has the property of strong local non-determinism. This strong local non-determinism basically says that uh, there are several ways to, to characterize this property. But at the very beginning, uh, when Simon Berman introduced this property of local, local non-determinism in the early, let's say late 90, uh, 1960s and 1970s, early 1970s, his idea was to, to say the following. His idea was say that a Gaussian process that has local non-determinism property, right? Its increments are approximately independent. Or you know a, a, a big portion of it could be independent, right? So that it is in some sense similar to that of Brownian motion. So it, he can use that to study the local times, right? But here we are using a different way to 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 denote this property. We're going to say that well, you know, the conditional variance of x j at the t, given the observations of x j at other points. S1, S2, and Sn, any number of points. This conditional variance has a lower bound, which is decided by the distance from T to some of those S, SL. Right? This is the distance of T to SL. Now this is in terms of conditional variance. Now it is useful in studying Gaussian processes because Gaussian process has a huge advantage, which says that conditional distribution of a Gaussian process, right, given the other observations in the process is still Gaussian. Its distribution has a mean, which is the conditional mean. Its variance is the conditional variance. So this is the reason why in the Gaussian, in the study of Gaussian processes, a bound like this is useful because it tells us the conditional density function. Right, it gives an upper bound for the conditional density function. Right, so that's, a, that's the reason why it is useful. We can do conditioning 
just like uh, you know, we do Markov property, we use Markov property to do condition. It allows us to compute, right? Join the distributions. And here, for Gaussian processes, you cannot do as precise as in the context of, of Markov process, but but it does give you good bounds in terms of you know conditional, in terms of the guys in here, conditional variance. So this is the reason why it is uh, it is useful, and we use that to establish the exact modules of continuity. So we could, you know, because the, in, in, everything is proved, right? We have the harmonized representation. From the harmonized representation, we could prove this property of local non-determinism. And once we have that, we are able to get this exact result with a equality equals to a constant. So this is a, a first, let's say, regularity result for a multivariate uh, uh, you know, Gaussian uh, random field. It's a you know special case, but uh, the method also works for uh, works for the Merton class. The Merton class is easy because the Merton class, the spectral density is given as we showed at the very beginning, and it's a lot simpler, right? So that's the reason I didn't mention anything about uh, the first class of random fields. Uh, so. But you look at the theorem, it only cares about the one coordinate, regularity of xj. It does not put the whole process x together as a vector valued process. Many questions can be raised for the vector valued processes from geometrical point of view or from topological point of view, right? Or from potential theory point of view. So I, I'm sorry to say that uh, for many questions that, that uh, one can ask, uh my answer you know would be i don't know it's just uh, it's it, it's it's not uh, studied or not so much studied so uh, so there are many open problems there but now i am going to just mention one result which is related to local time local time uh, it is basically from this uh, paper i wrote with a friend a couple of years ago a similar uh, uh, some similar results or you know some other results obtained by Professor Mountbrot and his student uh, at the pretty much the same time, but we were studying different aspects of local time. So that's a very interesting paper. Uh, so local time, the reason why I you know I choose this topic to say a little bit is for two reasons. One reason is that it has a lot of implication on the regularity and the geometry of random field X. So this is the part of sample path properties. On the other hand, local time also appear in many applied problems. I will mention this in just a moment because uh, uh, some of the authors, they are in Australia and uh, they did you know, beautiful work in there. So I think it's a, a very nice topic. But before we do that, uh, let me mention what local time is. Now here's a general definition. Even though in the title I say local time of uh, of uh, uh, operator fraction of Brownian but for the, but for the moment ignore that part. Y of t is any vector field, vector valued function, deterministic or random. They are both fine. Now t is let's say a rectangle in the domain, and then this mapping of course induces a measure in Rd by the, the image measure of, of, of the Lepig measure, right? So on, on T, there is a Lepig measure, and this is the induced measure, or this is the image measure of Lepig measure under this mapping Y. Now this measure, mu, is a measure on Rd. It may be nice, it may not be so nice, right? So if it is absolutely continuous with respect to the Lepig measure in Rd, then we're going to say that yt has a local time. And we define the Rotten Liquidin derivative of this occupation measure or the image measure with respect to the Lepig measure as the local time, right? So you can choose a version so that this guy has some nice properties. But we're going to ask for more. We're gonna say, well, you know, I know this is a variable, we call space variable, because it's in RD in the state space. It is also defined on the set that you choose, All right? So if you change this set, the local time might also change. So you have two variables. 
One is this uh, space variable. The other is the set variable. If I take this set to be a special set, like a rectangle, if I take this T to be a rectangle, then if I fix the left lower vertex, just to view it as a function of the upper right index, then I get a function which is a very, it's a function of space variable X and also the upper index T. So two variables, both are vector valued, okay. Then you ask, when can I choose a version of the local time so that this guy as a function of X and a T is continuous? So in the literature, they call such a continuity, the joint continuity of local time because it involves the time variable, involves the space variable. So this is something that we're gonna look at. Then people ask, well, why do you look at something like this? Now, I explained one application, which is to say, well, local time can be applied to study regularity properties of your original random field. It can also study geometrical properties of your random field and so on. However, in statistics, it comes up naturally when you're studying, let's say, integrated uh, time series. And you look at the partial sums of integrated uh, time series, so you lose stationarity, right? And then you, you take the partial sum of those integrated time series and you normalize. Sometimes it has a functional limit. It turns out that in many cases, if I know the integrated time series, know something about the time series that I started with, for example, the normalized uh, limit is fractional Brownian motion. Then if I do integral or fractional integral of that time series, I look at the partial sums, it will eventually convert, you know, you're dealing with a non-stationary uh, sequence now, uh, partial sum of non-stationary sequence. It may also have functional limit. And in those cases, the functional limit naturally is it can be expressed in terms of the local time of let's say fractional Brownian motion because I started with the time series which converges to fractional Brownian motion. So this, uh, I think that's a very interesting topic. And I learned this from a, uh, Professor Chi Yun Wang, uh, who's at uh, uh, Sydney, uh, and the Professor Philip, they have several very, you know, very nice written papers, very uh, informative. But uh, I will not, uh, you know, go in there. Just to, you know, mention this as a motivation for studying local times. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to uh, give you one example of the result on the local time that uh, we can establish. I still work with operator fraction of Brownian motion. The stationary case can be covered by the same method because uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's nicer. Now for the operator fraction of Brownian motion with the values in RD, right? Uh, with this exponent uh, D, a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of, uh, for, well, in the diagonal situation, this is necessary and sufficient is this, uh, is this condition satisfied? So if n is bigger than the sum of the real parts of the eigenvalues, then the local time exists. Not only the local time exists, I can choose a version which is continuous in x and t, right? So that's something nicer than just knowing that they exist. Then if, well, you know, if, if you prove that those guys are continuous, then you can ask for more. You can ask, what's the modulus of continuity? What's the modulus of continuity, right? So you take increments in terms of X or you take increments in terms of T, right? You can do something like that. So here we're gonna take increments over the space variable, not taking increments over the, I'm sorry, taking the increments over the time variable because that is useful for studying fractal properties. We're not going to take the increments over the space variable, even though that's also an interesting question, but I don't know much about it. It's a harder problem. So we're gonna take increments of the, in the time variable for this maximum local time. So in other words, I take the maximum in terms of the space variable, look at the maximum local time. Now, when the maximum is attained somewhere in the literature, this is also called a favorite point, right? You know, the, a point at which local time is large means that the process visit that, that place you know, more often than other places. So in turn, you know, they, they can 
characterize this as a favorite point of the process. So it is with this in mind, we want to say that, well, as, as R goes to zero, this ball gets smaller and smaller, this local time will go to zero because of the continuity, right? So you just want to know how fast it goes to zero. So we were able to prove that the modulus of continuity locally is something like that, uniformly is something like this. Uh, the expression is a little bit uh, complicated, so you can please ignore the form. What I want to point out is that, you know, the real parts of the eigenvalue plays a decisive role. Secondly, the form of the matrix plays an important role at the pre you know, precise uh, result level. So if it's not a diagonal matrix, then this log log vector will pick up some power, not just this. We'll, you know, we have some more power than just this one over here. Yeah, but that needs to be worked out like and specifically with concrete forms of D. So I just uh, want to add this as a, as a remark. So this is pretty much the main part that uh, I wish to talk about uh, for multivariate uh, random views. So we care about uh, their you know, interdependence. We care about the, their sample path properties in terms of regularity or in terms of geometry and things like that. Right. Uh, there are many unknown problems. Uh, I think uh, you know, some new tools may be uh, you know, necessary to, 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 to be developed right, in order to solve some of the problems. So, so for that matter, I think it could be motivating from, you know, sometimes. Uh, Professor Olenko, do I have, uh, it's uh, 50 minutes? Oh, you, you have around maybe 12 minutes. Yeah. Five minutes, okay. Oh, 12, uh, with five, 12, 12. 12 minutes. Okay, minutes, so I'm going to okay. use uh, about the 10 minutes mm -hmm. to say something about the extreme value probability. Now here, uh, so far, right, unlike what I said at the very beginning, what I said at the very beginning was that the interdependence among components are important, right? I want to show that the correlation among different components sometimes can affect my results. So far, this has not happened. So far, only the components, the, the parameters of each component themselves, like alpha one, alpha two, alpha d, right, plays the role. The correlation between x one t and x two t, they're not, they have not showed up yet. So, so, so this raises the question whether they are important or not, right? But of course, they should be important. And it turns out that uh, when we try to study excursion probabilities they are very much important. They affect the rate directly. So I'm gonna show you one result to indicate that phenomenon. This is the extreme probability that uh, I, uh, we're gonna look at. This in, in the book of uh, Adler, uh, or Adler and Taylor, they call this excursion probability. So this is an excursion probability. It turns out that to study this excursion probability is, is not easy. Uh, because you know, supremum of a Gaussian process, uh, it's 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 a it's a complicated object, right? Uh, there's no like a, you know explicit distribution except maybe a handful of examples. So what people do is try to get as precise as possible asymptotic results for this probability as u gets bigger and bigger. It turns out that whether x is smooth or X is rough makes a huge difference if you want to study precise asymptotic behavior of this probability. When X of T is smooth, you know, smooth meaning that sample function has continuous derivative. Then you have, you have tools such as Rice formula, you have differential topology, you know, like an Euler characteristic, right? Can come into play to help to get a very precise approximation to this probability. On the other hand, if you know, the sample function is not differentiable, then the tools I just mentioned will not work, right? So in that case, the best you can do is to prove something like a, a precise large deviation type of result that goes back to, uh, to, to pecan, that kind of nature. But what we care about is that we care about multivariate, right? So D-dimensional, I just take D equal to two, so bivariate. For a bivariate, for a bivariate uh, uh, 
random field x1 t x2 t or x t y t i take the supremum of each component so i take the supremum of the first component i take the supremum of the second component and I ask about the behavior of these probability so both supremum are bigger than you and then let you go to infinity right and uh, of course as you go to infinity this thing will go to zero so how how do you you know characterize characterize this more precisely and the peter Berg is a famous uh, you know ma probably mathematician studying extreme value theory he's very famous he has books and papers and uh, so he and uh, his co-author studied this problem in 2005 showing this large deviation type of result as u goes to infinity if you take a log of this function then the rate will still be like a one over u squared so this means that the tail still behaves like a, the tail of a normal distribution the, the the variance is something like you know given something in, in here all right so very much still like a, the large deviation result for the supremum of real value real value Gaussian random field or Gaussian process except that this this function over here is quite uh, complicated so we're not going to we, we don't have to worry about that right so along this line we want to people you know several authors want to improve this result by getting more and more precise asymptotics for the tail probability of multivariate random fields and there are several authors uh, I, I could mention uh, uh, in, in Poland, uh, the Biki, right? Uh, the, and in, in Switzerland, uh, Hashova, uh, they're, they're, they're working together. So it's a very strong group of people. They're working together on some of these issues. Now, what I looked at, so I'm going to skip some of the results because I just want to show you uh, what, uh, what, uh, what I, you know, together with a student, that was a student that graduated 2016, uh, 15, uh, we looked at the uh, extreme value probability of this kind for basically just for matern, matern class, bivariate matern class. However, the method allows us to go a little bit further. So our conditions are placed over the covariance function or co correlation function of the exponent. So I have two exponents. So locally, it behaves like a, something like this. And there's a you know high order infinitesimal after that. And uh, the cross covariance, we assume it is stationary. Now this guy over here does not have to be stationary because a lot of things could be buried in this uh, remainder, all right? And it turns out that this guy over here its value, the maximum value, plays a decisive role. Besides this alpha one and alpha two, we know that alpha one and alpha two, they do play big roles, right? But now we show that besides alpha one, alpha two, this maximum cross correlation, this is the correlation between x1, x2, right? So this is the maximum correlation. This thing also plays a big role. So I'm gonna show you a, a formula that indicates the role it plays. So I assume that S and T are two nice sets. So they're called Jordan measurable. According to Peter Berg, this means that the boundary has a big measure zero, but we don't have to go that far. We assume that S and T just uh, compact rectangles, compact rectangle. They can intersect each other. They can intersect each other in small portion on the boundary, or they can even be separated, right? So we started with the situation that they do intersect with each other with positive the big measure. So this is a nice case. And in this case, the tail probability behaves like uh, asymptotically like the right-hand side. Now, if you re re compare this result with the piquant result, which works with only one process, works with just one process, right? Then you will see piquant's constant, you would see the big measure of the index set. You would see a, 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 a power function decided by the fractal index. You would see the tail of a standard normal. That would be that that would be Pecan's result in the univariate case. In the bivariate case, the two components are correlated. So 
the main part of the tail, originally the tail was given by the standard normal. Now it is not. This guy over here for the bivariate case, because of the correlate, correlation between X1 and X2, this maximum correlation plays an explicit role. So as you can see that this, 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 makes, you know, this makes it a lot smaller, this role, right? This role make it a lot smaller than what the, the pecan's uh, tail, uh, the tail was two in the pecan's case, right? Here, this role plays a role. The rest of it, of course, they are not surprising. The rate, you know, contribution from the first one is here. The contribution from the second one is here. And the, the big measure of the intersection plays a role here. All right. So this is the result that uh, I would like to show that uh, not only the characteristics of each component play important roles in some results, the interdependence between the components also play explicit and a very important non-negligible, right? roles in the uh, in the in the result and uh, of course this this theorem considered the case that, that these two sets they are intersected well and then if they are not intersected well we also have results but that's less uh, that's uh, important so i thank you so much for your patience and uh, thank you well th thank you very much very informative talk and there's a lot of uh, results in different directions uh, thank you uh, now we have some time for questions or comments yeah so your questions, comments, unmute yourself and you can ask questions. I have a question. Um, thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I was interested in the, the result you, you gave on local times of um, mm -hmm. of the, the fields. And you sort of had a modulus of content. You had some sort of continuity result, essentially. Right, right. Uh, yeah, that one, right? Yeah. Um, does that Does that sort of give a corresponding result for the sort of lack of niceness of the yes. sample paths? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, that Berman had this observation saying that, that the nicer the local time, the rougher the sample path. So specifically, this the, this type of uh, upper bound, the uh, the this is a local modulus of continuity. This will imply a chon type of law of visual logarithm for the original process X. The second okay. result is uniform. It will imply that the sample function of X is nowhere differentiable and will give a modulus, a, a lower bound for the modulus of non-differentiability as well. They are very closely related as you, as you mentioned. Okay, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, thank you. Yeah, I guess that was, that was my main question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, you mean I, I have a question about the first part when you can see the, the components like independent uh, okay uh, separately so mm -hmm. you you uh, can see the specific class of uh, uh, this d for example mm -hmm. d is uh, either on diagonal or other blocks so right. if you move to uh, a general class so what is the main obstacle to obtain results so you can't get this inequality for conditional variance or uh yeah so so for the first part of the question is that if you have a more general index uh, d right mm -hmm. then uh, we can just uh, use this uh, uh, canonical decomposition of this uh, to write this d as a product of let's say a uh, the the, the block mm -hmm. diagonal matrix and then a inverse we can write in this form right and mm -hmm. then use this analysis to each component one by one so to derive mm -hmm. uh, regularity properties for each x i's okay however if you want to on the other hand if you want to look at the x as a whole then mm -hmm. we then the modules of continuity may not necessarily be the best tool to characterize the regularity because X1T may behave very differently from X2T, which may behave very differently from X3T, right? So there may be another way, like a base of type, using vector value or operator, you know, using some other forms to characterize the regularity of the process as a whole. Those things might be more beautiful than characterizing the, the like what I did you know, in, in, in here. So, so these results, they, they, are for, they are for each component. 
this they are still okay look like this but if i work look, look at the x of t as a whole i don't think that uh, you know a modulus of continuity like this is the best way to 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 go uh, i would rather think that uh, a general form like a base of regularity for multivariate functions might be might be neater cleaner okay thank you Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, any other any questions? Other questions? Okay, if not, uh, I believe we are running out of time and some people they have classes, so mm -hmm. I see they start leaving talk. So thank you very much for your presentation. And I just would like to remind uh, all participants that the next talk will be in September and Giovanni Peccati will be given presentation for the seminar. Okay, have a good day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.